Hi, Valeria. Oh, no, not yet. Hi, Valeria. Valeria? Hi. Hi. Did you have any questions, Valeria? Um, no, not really. I was just wondering if anybody else was going to get in the meeting. Uh, basically, this is office hours. So, uh, oh, so but it's I, 10. Yeah, it's 10. It's uh, I have office hours oh, from 9.45 to 10.15. Oh, that's true. Sorry, I'm a little no, no. messed up at the time. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. It, the, the class begins at 10.15. If you want to hang around, good. If not, okay. then... That's right. Yeah, I, I had gotten confused because I have another class at 10. But um, no, I'm good. I, I'll just, I'll, just I'll head out, make some breakfast, and then I'll come back. <laughs> okay. All right, thank Am you. Am I going to get to see what you're eating? Uh. Maybe. All right. <laughs> I might eat it fast. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye. Uh, okay. Parker's in. Let's see who else is in here. Ethar, Araceli, anybody have any questions? I do have a question. Okay, Araceli. I'm sorry. Uh, Ethar. 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 Um, it wasn't the quiz was uh question nine question nine on the quiz yes okay if you can hold on one second i am literally uh it timed me out of my uh my uh canvas account so it's i'm getting it back even as we speak okay so what was the question about Just give me a moment so you can see it. Okay. Uh, I can share my screen if you want to. No, that's okay. I've got it up here now. Okay. Uh, it was quiz. It was quiz. Which ten. quiz? Ten. Is ten? Mm -hmm. Okay, quiz ten and. Which question now? Nine. Thank you. All right. Okay, magnesium hydroxide. We're gonna get into this today, okay? This is this is the last ice diagram we're gonna have to deal with, okay, Ethar? Ethar, you there? Yes. Okay. Are you seeing the screen? No. Okay, well then that would help then. Now you're seeing it. Yes. Okay, now a KSP is gonna is just another equilibrium constant. Okay, Ethar? And because we're adding a salt to water. Those are our reactants, okay? And what you're making is you're actually making the ions. So if I have magnesium hydroxide and I put that into water, I'm making magnesium ions and I'm making hydroxide ions, correct? Both of those will have concentrations. 
okay? Now, magnesium hydroxide's a solid. Remember what we said we do with solids. We don't include them in the equilibrium constant, uh, equilibrium equation, right, Aether? The other thing on the reactant side is water. We don't include water. So the equilibrium constant, because it is a solubility product, it's called a KSP. And if I have a KSP, that's going to be equal to my cation concentrations raised to the coefficient times my anion concentration raised to its coefficient. So if I'm dealing with magnesium hydroxide, magnesium cation, there's magnesium hydroxide makes one magnesium ion of a plus two. It makes two hydroxides. Does this make any sense, Ether? Yes. So when I do the equilibrium equation, my KSP is equal to my magnesium concentration times my hydroxide squared. Okay? My calcium is equal to calcium ion times hydroxide squared. Now the difference is that constant is much smaller for magnesium hydroxide than it is for calcium hydroxide. Okay? So it's going to need, we're going to need a much lower quantity of, of OH or, or sodium hydroxide to reach this number, aren't I? Aether. Uh, could you just say that again, please? I'm going to need a much smaller quantity of mm -hmm. OH to reach this number than to reach this number because this number is a magnitude of seven times smaller than this one is, right? So I'm gonna to have to add less OH to this one to reach this number than I would to reach this number. Is that making sense, Athar, so far? Yes. Now, once I reach this number, I'm in equilibrium because K equilibrium is equal to Q. Does that make sense, Athar? Once I'm in equilibrium, I have some of the positive of the precipitate, some of the solid material, as well as some of the ions. So if I have some of the solid material, that means the solid must have formed. But it must have occurred in a much lower concentration of OH than occurred with calcium hydroxide. Does that make sense, Athar? Yes. So that's why the answer, my, my, the answer should have been, <laughs> that's a great, great question here. The answer should have been the magnesium hydroxide will precipitate out until all of it has precipitated. Then the calcium will start to precipitate out. Now, drum roll, is that what the answer is? Okay, do you see that, Athar? Yes. And that's how you that's how you analyze these particular problems. You look at the KSPs. You find out which one is smaller. The smaller one will precipitate out first. Then, if you have any OH left over, the other one will precipitate out. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I'm getting crickets, guys. I got four minutes before I begin class. Okay. How'd you guys do on this quiz? Was it a hard one?
You guys are that mad at me that you're not even talking to me about it? Are you hearing me? Okay, I'm starting to worry that you're not hearing me. Guys? Jenna, are you hearing me? I am now. Sorry, it was taking a while. No, no. I, uh, I just, I'm getting no response from anybody. So I'm wondering, Parker, are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. I'm sorry. Was I, was I blank there for a while? No, no, no. I just, I was not paying attention. That's my no, bad. No, it's no, uh, no problem. I just, every now and again, for some reason or other, I hit a wrong, what is that? Uh, a longhorn in the back? Parker? Oh, on the shelf? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I got to have an explanation. Oh, it's for the front of my truck. And that explains everything. Are yeah. you from Texas? No, I'm from Florida. And you're just going to leave it like that? Yeah. After we get my truck fixed, it's going on the front, on the hood. Why? Do you want to do you, gore somebody? Do you no. To, are you trying to intimidate pedestrians? No, I, I mean, I just wanted to put it on there. It, it was a gift for my Meemaw. Okay. Is your Meemaw a Texan? No, she's from Tennessee. So, <laughs> similar. Okay, fine. That explains everything. I'll let you off the hook here. <laughs> All right. Anybody have any questions? You got one minute before class begins. Nothing. Everybody's perfect. Everybody's so happy with ice diagrams that you're not going to be disappointed that we have one last set of them, are you? Jenna looks happy. Jenna is jumping up in joy here. <laughs> Benita, how are you doing? Good, how are you? What is the dark carnival? Oh, <laughs> this was back in my school in Missouri. We had like a, a carnival for Halloween. Ah, which school yeah. in Missouri? Uh, Lindenwood University. Okay, I, I, I should have known that, shouldn't I? Where yeah. is that at? It's St. Charles, Missouri. That's in, uh, that's, is that uh, it's by towards the Southwest? Is it where? Is it towards the Southwest near Branson? Branson? Oh, I'm not sure about Branson. I don't know. Okay. Is near St. Louis? Have you ever heard of St. Louis? <laughs> yes, I've heard of St. Louis. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I've it's... actually been to St. Louis. I oh, suffered good. through a baseball game once there. Oh, yeah, the Cardinals. So where is it at in terms of St. Louis? <laughs> I can't even. I Honestly, I cannot tell you. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I cannot tell you. You've it's been near. there, but you can't. Yeah, if, if I, I set you down in the airport of St. Louis and told you to start walking there, you would have no idea which way to go. Probably not. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Good enough. Good enough. I'll stop picking on you then. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we got to finish up titration curves. Got to finish up titration curves tonight. And oh, I need to talk to Natalia before we once she gets in here. Oh, we're all the way there. Nope, we're not quite there. Hmm. Natalia, you're there while I'm trying to figure out where I'm at. Hello, good morning. You called me to tell you, didn't you? Yeah, it was yesterday. I left you a voice message. Uh -huh. I tried to call you back this morning. You didn't answer. Oh, I think, yeah. Oh, I just saw it, sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Maybe we're gonna get lucky and I'm not gonna do a titration. 
All right, we're going to try it this way. I can't find it. Uh, so what was the question about, Natalia? It was about the beverage that we were going to use, because I believe our proposal, proposal had um, Coke and Pepsi. But then we told you that it had citric acid, so you told us to change it. And we I, showed... OK, I don't believe I don't believe it's going to matter. OK, I don't believe it's going to matter. The you, it, it had citrate in there and benzoate, correct? Yes, the uh, Coke Zero, yeah. I don't believe it's going to matter uh, because of the fact that uh, the benzoate is a uh, fairly weak conjugate base and the citrate is a fairly weak conjugate base. Okay. So I don't okay. think it's gonna matter, but it may. Okay. But if it um, may, Natalia, if it does happen, that's good news for you. It's gonna screw up your experiment, but in the conclusion, when you talk about errors, that's gonna be something you talk about, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the results, you think, that's, that's a perfect example of an error analysis. My compound contained, it, contained benzoate and citrate, which are both conjugate bases, which may have, which may have interfered with my pH. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, no, there's no problem. All right. Uh, can everybody see the screen that's on there now? Yes. Thank you, somebody, for answering. Who was the somebody that answered? Who was the nice person that answered? Aether. Thank you, Aether. Okay, just to, just to go over what I talked about at the end of class on Tuesday. If I have a strong base and I'm titrating it with a, I'm sorry, so where is it? If I have a strong acid and I'm titrating it with a strong base, that means if I'm titrating it with a base, I am putting the base slowly into the acid. So I got to think, what's my, what is my pH going to be versus the milliliters of sodium hydroxide? Because it's a strong acid, I'm going to start at a fairly low pH. That pH is going to gradually increase until I reach the point where my base is almost equal to my acid. And as a matter of fact, it is equal to my acid. So I add one more little drop of base. At this point, all I'm recording is the concentration of my base, which means my pH is gonna go shooting up. As it goes shooting up, it's gonna go past the equivalence point. And then when it reaches a certain point, it's gonna to start to level out again. And as it's gonna level out, and when it reaches the next plateau, at that point, all we're doing is adding base and we finally reached, we finally reached in our titrating solution, we finally reached the concentration of the base. Is all of this making sense, ladies and gentlemen? I have a question. I'm here, Emmanuel. Um, and a strong acid and a strong base can't make a buffer, correct? Correct. Okay. Because you do not, in a strong acid, your conjugate base is so weak that the conjugate base will not uh, pick up a proton from water to make OH minus. That won't happen. In a strong base, the conjugate acid is not strong enough to pull an OH away from water to make H plus. So in that instance, I have a strong acid and a strong base, no buffer, no buffering region. Are we good, ladies and gentlemen? Any other questions? So when I'm trying to determine my equivalence point, I'm gonna take my high pH and my low pH. 
I'm going to average them. That's going to be the pH out at my equivalence point. I find it on my y-axis, go over to the graph, drop it down to the x-axis, and I read what the milliliters of base are. That's the volume of base that is needed to neutralize the acid. So if I'm doing this curve, if I am doing this curve, I'm looking at this at about two, this at about 12, 12 and two are 14, divide that by two, my pH is seven. So I'm gonna find it, I'm gonna find my arrow first. I'm gonna find it on the Y axis. Sorry, I got something in my eye. I'm gonna find my pH of seven on the Y axis, take it over to the curve, drop it down. It took 20 milliliters of base to neutralize my acid. Any questions about this? Is anybody out there? I, I do have a question. Thank you, Parker. Is the, is the equivalence point always going to be when the pH is 7? No, absolutely no? Okay. not. I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Okay. okay? All right. At the equivalence point, moles of H3O equals moles of H minus. As I stated, this is moles of H3O is equal to OH minus, not moles of base or acid. Why? Okay. I'm gonna to go to participants. Benita. Why am I saying, ah, it helps if I don't give you the answer. Oh, All right, the reason oh. is, sorry, Panita. <laughs> the reason okay. is the moles of acid may deliver more than one mole of H plus, or the moles of base may deliver more than one mole of OH minus. If the moles of H plus delivered by the acid do not equal the moles of OH delivered by the base, then you've got a difference in stoichiometry. If you have a difference in stoichiometry, you're gonna to have to use the molar ratio. If they do equal, if the moles that the acid delivers of H equal the moles of OH delivered by the base, you can use this simplified formula because you don't have to deal with the molar ratio. So you can take the molarity of the acid times the molarity, like the volume of the acid, that's equal to the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. Units of volume do not matter. Why? Why don't, guys. Araceli, why don't the units of Ah, why don't the units of the acid and the, of the volume matter when you're doing MAVA equals MBVB? Uh, are they just, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Oh, is it because they're not like related towards the like, um, like finding the certain pH? Okay, Araceli, if you had milliliters as your volume, okay? What would you need to turn that into liters? 
Uh, you would have to um, so go from milliliters to liters. Yes. Wouldn't you have to um, times it by a thousand milliliters? If you're going from milliliters, two liters, you have to divide it by a thousand. Okay, Aris, <laughs> Yeah. All right. Now, look at this. If I'm dividing by a thousand on the left, and both of these are in milliliters, wouldn't I have to divide it on the right as well? Yes. So whatever I'm using to convert the volume on the left side, I'm going to have to use that same conversion on the right side. So as long as the label of the volume is the same, I don't have to convert it. I can use ounces over here. I can convert it to gallons if I so wish. It doesn't matter. I could take the molarity of my acid times gallons equal to X molarity of my base times gallons, and I will get the correct answer. Okay, now, what's the first thing you notice about this titration curve versus strong acid with the strong base? Get a mental picture of this one versus oh, I could use that versus that one. This is a titration curve. Picture of that versus this. Can anybody see a difference? Um, the, the volume's different, but the starting pH, I guess? Both. Benita, oh, yeah. gr two great observations. For one thing, for one thing, it's taking more base. It's taking more base to do the, to do the titration. And the second point she pointed out was the fact that the pH starts at a higher point than the pH of the strong acid. And that makes sense because you are starting out with the weak acid. You would expect the weak acid to have less H3O in it. The other point is that I want to point out to you. Look at the graph. Look at the graph from where you started to where it starts to go up drastically. You have a slow slope. You have a low slope there. When you are doing the weak base, that slope, doesn't the slope look a little bit bigger than that? Yes. Thank you so much. All right. That portion of the graph, this portion here is called the buffering region. You have to understand what is happening. Strong base reacts 100% with the weak acid. So the base, the OH from the base is reacting with the proton of the acid to make water. What is left is the cation of the base that's reacting with the anion of your acid to make the salt. The salt is your conjugate base. So as I'm adding sodium hydroxide in here, I'm adding conjugate base in there. That base that I'm adding is causing the pH to go up in a larger to a larger extent than my strong acid did because the strong acid didn't have a conjugate base. So my pH is going up a little more rapidly. But again, once I reach the point where I've used up all my acid, it goes up very steeply. And then it levels off again. So up to now, the differences between the two are, you start out for a weak acid, you start out at a higher pH. 
it has a buffering region. Now, look at where the equivalence point is. What is this about? Somebody tell me what the pH at the equivalence point for this is. For this, I would say it's between eight and nine. PH. Between eight and nine. Now, let's look back. What's this equivalence point? Right at seven. About seven. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because look, when I'm with the weak acid, Remember, at the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, the moles of my weak acid equal the moles of my strong base. But remember, at that point, when they're equal, remember that I've also created the conjugate base. So if I'm at the point where moles of acid equal moles of base, I've created conjugate base. So the pH where they are equal, I've got more moles of base than I do of acid because of the creation of the conjugate base. With that in mind, Parker, with that in mind, my pH is gonna be elevated. So I'm not gonna have a pH of seven. I'm gonna have a pH of between eight and nine in this instance. Does that make sense, Parker? Yes, it does. All right, another point of the weak acid with strong base. I can find, I can find the Ka with this curve. At the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, I've got the milliliters of NaOH. If I take half of those milliliters of NaOH and take it up to the pH curve and then move it over to the pH, that will give me my pKa. So if I'm looking at this, my milliliters of base occurred at 50 milliliters. Half of that is 25. I take that up to the curve and then move it over. I probably have somewhat something close to a pH of five. At that point, moles of, of uh, uh, conjugate base is equal to moles of my acid, my weak acid. When moles of acid equal moles of base by Henderson Hasselbeck, the pH is equal to pKa. Does that make sense, guys? So I can ask you, if I have a curve of a weak acid with a strong base, I can give you this curve and you can give me an estimation of the pKa. Now I pointed this out on Tuesday. Look at where the equivalence point is and look at the graph beyond the equivalence point. Again, equivalence point, I go straight up as I'm approaching the pH of my base, it levels, it kind of gradually levels off until I get to the pH of my base. As I have a weak acid, the same thing is occurring. After the equivalence point, do I have any more weak acid?
No. Thank you so much. The longer you guys take to answer these questions, the more dragged out this is gonna be. So please answer the questions in a more timely fashion. There's no more acid at the equivalence point. So in effect, all I'm doing to my solution is adding base. So after the equivalence point, my titration curve for a weak acid and a strong base is going to be the same as it is for a strong acid with a strong base. Now, if I am titrating a weak base with a strong acid, how is that going to differ from this titration curve? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm showing you the titration of a weak acid with a strong base. If I reverse that and do a, a weak base with a strong acid, what does my titration curve look like? I think that the equivalency point would lean more between uh, five and six pH. And yep. uh... go ahead, Jana. You're doing good so far. And I think that um, the graph generally would be flipped upside down compared to the one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If I have a weak base, if I'm starting out with a weak base, my pH is gonna be somewhere around 12. Strong base, it would be closer to 13. But my, if I have a weak base somewhere between 11 and 12, and again, I'm also going to get a buffering region, just like I did for the weak acid, as I get close to the equivalence point, it's gonna shoot up, then it's gonna level off again. As with weaker acids, the initial pH is gonna be higher and the pH changes near the equivalence point are going to be subtler. If you have a weaker acid, a Ka of 10 to the minus 10, you are going to have barely a jump. You guys are gonna notice this. You're gonna notice it very much when you're doing your phosphoric acid, those of you that are doing the face-to-face -face labs. What's gonna happen is your first H from, pH, from H3PO4 is gonna be a strong acid, so you're gonna see it. Your second one is gonna be a weaker acid, so it's gonna kinda like look like this. And your third one, you're not gonna even really be able to see. So as the acid gets weaker, that jump, the jump between low pH and high pH gets much more subtler. Again, to get the Ka of a weak acid or a weak base for that matter, or Kb for, uh, sorry, it's Ka for the weak base as well. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're going to find the equivalence point. Vertically go down the x-axis and read the milliliters of the OH that's added. Divide that number by two. Move over on the x-axis to the new milliliters, go vertically until you reach the titration curve, go left and read the pH. That is gonna be the Ka for your acid, or if you do it, if it's a titration curve of a weak base, that would be your K B K A for your base. It's K A because we're measuring uh, pH. Remember, there's no K A for strong acids and strong bases. It's infinite. You're not creating any conjugate base. 
The only OH that's produced there is from the strong base. Again, this shows you what a weak acid with a strong, a weak base with a strong acid titration curve looks like. Again, buffering region, lower, lower pH. Again, you have an equivalence point. This would be a strong base with a strong acid. The other difference is, as Janice said, the equivalence point is going to be lower pH. Slide between the two. I've already talked about the differences. Now, if you have a polyprotic acid, such as phosphoric acid, you are going to get an equivalence point for each, for each H that gets delivered. The first H is a fairly strong acid, so you're not going to see that very well. As you go to release the second one, you're going to see one. You're going to see a third one. It's not going to be as prevalent as you see here, but you will see two of the equivalence points. Lab question. A student fails to notice an air bubble in the burette before the titration has reached the equivalence point. How does this affect the titration? You are titrating a strong acid with a strong base. How does the bubble affect the titration? Um, the I think it would wouldn't it be off because you're counting the oh, good the milliliters that are in the. Um, the the burette so it, um your solution the amount would be off okay are you adding do you think you're adding too much base or too little anaya um it would be too little what's your second guess too much you think you're adding too much because the air bubble is taking up some of the volume yes so you actually are thinking you're adding volume when actually you're just adding air. Yes. So your volume of base is going to be too high, which is going to make your MB, VB, that quantity too high. You're going to subsequently uh, assume that you're, you're going to basically make a calculation where your molarity of your acid is going to be too high. Yes. And it's not right. And it's not right. What happens after the bubble, somebody other than Anaya, what happens if the bubble happens after the equivalence point? Then Jenna, are you trying to answer? Really affect your... Jenna? Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. I'm more just thinking it through. Jenna? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I was thinking, um... If it showed up after the equivalency point, then I would assume it wouldn't really affect your experiment. Just ensure that before- Absolutely perfect. Because guys, you've already reached the equivalence point. You've already added the amount of base that you need to. Remember, it shoots up drastically. So you're not gonna appear to add any more base. Uh, where are we at? Okay. Now, if we're doing pH of a strong acid with a strong base, what happens when you add 49 milliliters of HCl to 50 milliliters of your base? What is the pH going to be? Okay. What do you have in excess? I'm sorry, excuse me. It's 49 milliliters of OH added to 50 milliliters of HCl. What do you have in excess, base or acid? 
base. You're adding, it's you're adding 49 milliliters of 0.1 molar NaOH to 50 milliliters of HCl. What's in excess? Acid. The acid is in excess because I'm adding more volume of acid. So is the, I'm sorry, the acid is reacting with all of the base. So if I figure out my moles of acid, I take the volume times the molarity, I get five times 10 to the minus third moles of H plus. I have 4.9 times 10 to the minus third moles of OH. Riddle me this, Batman. How many moles of H plus do I have left? Okay. Uh, sir, can you repeat the question? I have, because I multiplied the molarity times the volume of my H plus, I have 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar H plus solution. That gives me five times 10 to the minus third moles of H plus. I've got 49 milliliters of my base. I multiply that by my concentration of base. I have 4.9 times 10 to the minus third. The question is how much excess moles of H plus do I have? Would it be 0 0.0001 moles? Absolutely. It's 0 0.1 times 10 to the minus third or 1.0 times 10 to the minus fourth, 0 0.0001. Now, what's the pH of that, guys? That answer's wrong. It, I got four. Okay. Four is correct answer. Four is the correct answer. Well, actually it's off a bit. Okay, it's off a bit. I, I, I'm wrong about that. I'm wrong about that last statement because I, you're right in the fact that you have 0 0.0001 moles of H plus, but you have to understand that that number of moles is not in 100 milliliters. It is in 0 0.099 liters. So when I do that math out, That ends up being one times 10 to the negative third molar, essentially one times 10 to the minus third molar. Take the pH of that, I get three. Do you understand who called it four? I did. Uh, who, okay, Parker. Do you understand that you were right and you have 0 0.0001 moles? Yeah, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't take into account the, the volume uh, subtract yeah the volume okay so you've got to do that on the other hand if i have 51 milliliters of naoh what's going to happen when i have 51 is i'm going to have 101 milliliters and when I do this math out, it's going to actually be have a POH of about three. Same general math. Bottom line, strong acids or strong bases are going to react with the opposite thing. They will, if they're, if you take place a strong acid in with a weak base, it will react 100%. Strong base will react 100% with the weak acid.
I need to get into it. I'll get back to this if necessary. If I have time. This is where I want to be. Okay. Mm, looking at something, guys, just real quick. We have a test on next Tuesday. I want to make sure I go over solubility products before we get that test. Any question on titration curves or buffers? If I have time, I'll go over those extra questions. Any questions on buffers or titration curves? Okay, somebody asked me about the question in the quiz about magnesium hydroxide and uh, uh, calcium hydroxide. And I brought up that we have an equilibrium constant that we can use for salts as well. If I'm putting something like barium sulfate, which is a solid, it's a solid that does not dissolve very much. If I put that into water, what I make are barium ions and sulfate ions, which are aqueous. And as I stated when answering the question, when we have a solid material, we do not include that in the equilibrium expression. This is placed with water. We never include water in an equilibrium expression. So if I'm gonna get the equilibrium expression for barium and sulfate, I'm gonna call that a special kind of equilibrium constant, just like I did with Ka. This is gonna be KSP, it's the solubility product. And what it's going to be equal to is it's going to be equal to the concentration of my one ion raised, raised to the coefficient. So in this case, it would be the barium concentration raised to the one power times the sulfate raised to the two. So that is my KSP for barium sulfate. Note the solid barium sulfate and the water is not included. You're going to have to learn, ah, it's not what I wanted to do. You're gonna to have to be able to learn to see what these things break up into. Damn it. I know what's happening. <sighs> and show. Oh, that's why. Thank you. I have another, I have another salt. I have What does this break into? I have Cu, Cl2, that's a solid. I'm adding this 
to water. What ions do I form? Would it be HCl? Nope. I'm, I'm not, these are not strong enough to pull the H away from water. Water is a fairly strong bond. What happened when I did the barium sulfate in water? What did I make? So do they separate into like just their individual? So it's is it like, Go ahead. is it C, um, Cu2 and then just Cl? Just Cl? C, is it Cl minus? Just one of them? I oh, know, two Cl or Cl2, whatever. I, yeah. Now it's not Cl2. Make sure you understand what you're doing. Yeah, what the hell? Make sure you know what you're doing. The ion, when you have copper chloride, that is making two chloride ions. If I have something like aluminum, What is this making? That one would be Al3 plus 3Cl. Plus how many, Parker? Three. Does that make sense to you, ladies and gentlemen? Are you seeing what we're breaking the ionic compounds? Are you seeing the products of breaking the ionic compounds into their individual ions is. Aether, are you still here? Yes. Jordan. Here. Vanessa. Here. Natalia. Here. Vanita. Vanita. I'm here. Sarah. Gianna. Jenna. Here. Jennifer. Here. Manuel. Here. Parker. Yes, you're here. Here. Cherie. Cherie? Araceli? Here. Jessica? Here. Keanu? Valeria? Valeria? Here. Thank you. Jana? Here. Leonardo? Here. Anaya? Here. Natalie? Here. Sachari? Here. Raylena? Rhea? Here. Emily? Here. Delexis? Ethan? Here. Good, Ethan. If my copper chloride, copper two chloride breaks into copper plus two plus two Cl minuses, 
Can you tell me what my equilibrium constant is? Um, like KSP will be uh, like Cu uh, two plus and Cl minus to like raised to the power of uh, two. Okay. Is there anybody that does not see this? Okay. Valeria, if that is true for this solubility, what is KSP? for this second reaction, ALCL3. What do you think that is? Um, would it be H2 and then the CL? Valeria, when I put took CuCl2, mm -hmm. I made the ion Cu2 plus and two Cl minuses. So my KSP was Cu2 plus concentration times the concentration of Cl minus squared. Okay. Look at AlCl3. Okay. What does that turn into? Um cl to the third that'll work and what else uh times al cl to the third as well did i use cu cl2 in this expression no you just used the cu so just al just the al Generally speaking, you do the cations before, before you okay. do the anions. Can you do the one from the quiz? Which one, the magnesium hydroxide and the calcium hydroxide? Um, it was um, for the Al2S3. It was asking is, us. I'm was... doing a similar thing right now. Okay. And you can answer that yourself. What does this make? Would it be CR and SO4? Okay. How many CRs? Mm. How many atoms of CR do I have on the left? Is it? Two. Two. So it's going to be, I'm making okay. two of them. Mm -hmm. How about my SO4s? You have three. So what is the equilibrium expression, the KSP, for this going to be? So CR to the second power and times SO4 to the third power. Exactly. 
Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? I have a quick question. I'm here. Do you have to include the two minus in the KSP? Yes. Okay. Except when you get irritated. Except when you get very extremely irritated. That's what it should look like. Okay, Jordan. Yeah, I was just curious if we had to add it or not, or. Yeah, it's technically speaking, technically speaking, you should add the, the uh, charges on the individual ions. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, now this is gonna be impossible to read unless I go to the slideshow. Write, write the expression for calcium fluoride and look up the corresponding KSP value. Ladies and gentlemen, in the back of your books, there are appendices. You will see the first, first real appendice deals with uh, delta H's, delta G's, and delta S's. The next one has aqueous equilibrium constants. That is what I am talking about. It is KSP. You have the salts labeled in terms of the name and their formula, and you will see what their corresponding KSP values are. If I look up calcium fluoride, what is happening is I'm making calcium ions and fluoride ions. So that is the equation. Anaya, if this is the equation, what is the solubility product constant expression? What's hey, KSP okay. equal to? Uh, KSP is equal to um, CA times F squared? Two, yeah, exactly. Yeah. CA2 plus times F minus squared. Okay. Now, if I look up calcium fluoride in my, in my little chart, I end up with a number 1.46 times 10 to the minus 10. Whoa. That's interesting. This number is wrong. It should be 1.46 times 10 to the minus 10. It's not my original slide. Those are the real numbers for those two things. I have to go in and this is not my slide, so and remember, it's not KSP is not solubility. If I was dealing with solubility, I would be dealing with a concentration term such as moles per liter or grams per liter. That is what a solubility is. It's not a KSP, it's an equilibrium constant. So if I have my concentration of silver being 1.3 times 10 to the minus fourth, 
calculate my KSP for this. Okay. My silver concentration is 1.3 times 10 to the minus fourth. Can somebody tell me off the top of your head, what's the relationship between the number of ions of chromate, CrO4, what's the ratio of chromate ions that are formed to silver ions that are formed? Ethan, my compound is Ag2CrO4, Ethan. Okay. What is the ratio of CrO4 to Ag? Uh, there's uh, one CrO4 for uh, every two Ag, so it's like one half. Exactly. So if I've got one half of the chromate ions forming and my silver is 1.3 times 10 to the minus fourth, wouldn't you assume that the chromate solute, uh, ions are going to be half of that? Yeah, yeah. Did anybody not understand what I just said? I didn't understand. Thank you, Natalia. Okay, Natalia, can you see that there is one CrO4 for every two AGs? Yes, I do you, can. Do you see that, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if I know what my Ag concentration is, since I produce one CrO4 for every two AGs, then my chromates that form are going to be half of what my AGs are. Yes, I do see it now. So I do that, my chromate is going to be 6.5 times 10 to the minus fifth. Now can I solve for KSP? Natalia. Yes. Can I solve for KSP now? Mm -hmm. Yes. How am I going to do it? Um, wouldn't it be the concentration of AG times the Concentration of CR. Oh. One slight mistake, Natalia. It's AG what? Oh, squared. Yeah. AG squared times the concentration of CRO4. Yes. So I'm going to do that number out. I'm going to take my AG concentration, square it, multiply it by my CRO4, and that is going to be 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12. Now, guys. It may seem like we're double dipping. It may seem like not only did we double the concentration of my AG, but I also squared it. You have to solve the problems in this way. You have to figure out how much of the AG is made in relationship to the other ion. Then you still have to use the coefficients as well have to do that. I have magnesium hydroxide. It's in contact with my undissolved solid. This means I have an equilibrium. I have some solid MgOH in solution and I have some that's a solid. Assuming that the MgOH2 that's in water is just completely dissociated. And there are no other ions that are reacting with this. Calculate the KSP for this solution. Okay. How did I do it? Do I know how much I did it by pure math? Oh, I know how I did it.
Okay. What information is in here that's going to allow us to get some sort of concentration? The pH. Thank you very much, Benita. You saw it immediately. It took me a few seconds to figure it out. Good for you. Okay, so I know my pH is 10.17. So my pH is 10.17. What do I have to do? Damn it. Ah, okay. Yeah, good. Uh, somebody shoot me, please. Why is this not allowing me to do to do work? My pH is equal to 10.17. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, can I get a POH? Somebody tell me how to get a POH. Um, you subtract 14 minus 10.17. Thank you very much. That is going to equal 3.83. 3.83. Is that correct? Yes. All right. No, that's not molar. That's my POH. So my, my OH concentration is going to be equal to 10 raised to the negative So I'm going to take my 10 to the x power. This gives me a concentration of 1.48 e to the minus 4. Now I have my OH concentration. It's mg. OH taken twice. What is this making? What is this making, ladies and gentlemen? Which ions are is it making? Magnesium and hydroxide. How many hydroxides? Two. Two hydroxides. Okay, so backspace. So I'm making Mg two plus plus two OH minuses. Okay. What's my KSP, guys? Mg, the concentration of magnesium times the concentration of hydroxide squared. Okay. Would everybody agree this? Yes. Okay, Benita, do I know my concentration 
of OH minus? Yes. So if I know my concentration of OH minus, do I also know my concentration of Mg? Is it just a ratio or no? Yes, it's just a ratio. So how much Mg would I have? Um, half of um, LH. So Benita, while I got you with me, how do I determine what my KSP is? Then you, you multiply them. I'm going to take my, my 7.4. E <laughs> to the minus four. I'm going to multiply that by my 1.48. Sorry, this is 10 to the minus five. Now, what am I going to have to do with my hydroxide? Square. Thank you so much. So I'm going to take this number, multiply it by 1.48, negative 4 times 1.48, negative 4. And I end up with 1.61 e to the minus 12th. Damn it. It pays for me to look at the slides I had. Again, sometimes we're going to need to do ice diagrams. If the KSP for calcium fluoride is 3.9 times 10 to the minus 11th, assume that the calcium fluoride dissociates completely upon dis dissolving and there are no other equilibria Calculate KAF2 in grams per liter. Okay, I have my KSP. I know that my calcium is X and my fluoride is two times that because the relationship coefficient wise is one to two. My KSP is gonna be my calcium times my fluoride, I get x times 2x squared. This equals 4x cubed. I divide the 3.9 times 10 to the 11th by 4, take the cube root of it. I get my concentration of calcium. So this is how much calcium dissolves in one liter. I want to know grams per liter. So I multiply it by the molecular weight. This gives me the grams of calcium fluoride per liter of solution. The important part of this is the top part. Now, what happens if we already have some sulfate in solution? How's that going to affect our equilibrium? All right. We have calcium fluoride in a solution. I need to calculate the concentration of each in 0.1 molar calcium nitrate. I know what my KSP value is. It's 3.9 times 10 to the 11th, raised to the 11th, negative 11th power. I know what my starting concentration of calcium is because this number is so low, I'm probably not going to 
affect that final concentration. So my con initial concentrations in my ice diagram, I have no, no calcium fluoride. I have 0 0.10 molar calcium, no fluoride. What happens is I am the calcium fluoride that I make from adding calcium to it, I'm going to get plus X for calcium plus two X for fluorine. So my equilibrium concentration of calcium is 0 0.01 plus X. My fluoride concentration is two X. I have a question. Yes. If the coefficient in front of the F minus changes, does the two change as well? Yes. Okay. If it was like, if this were aluminum fluoride, this would be three F minus, and this would be plus three X, and it would be three X in the equilibrium equation, it would be three X cubed. Okay. Again, I know what my KSP is. I know that my concentration of calcium is this, and my cal fluoride concentration at equilibrium is this. I do them, I assume X is zero in this term. I do the math out, I get 3.1 times 10 to the minus fifth molar. That's my concentration of calcium. Therefore, my, I'm sorry, excuse me, that's the concentration of X. My concentration of fluoride is going to be two times that. Questions on that, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Second part of that question. If I have the same concentration in sodium fluoride, how is that going to affect my equilibrium? Again, my calcium is going to be X in that term. If I'm doing my ice diagram, if I've got sodium fluoride, then I have 0 0.10 molar fluoride I'm adding 2x to that, and I'm adding x of calcium. So I've got x times 2x quantity squared, or 0 0.01 quantity squared. That, when I divide it into 3.9 times 10 to the minus 11th, gives me 3.9 times 10 to the minus 7th. Look at this. Same concentrations of my salts. My fluoride affected the reaction much more than my calcium did. Some of the things that affect solubility. One is pH by Le Chatelier. If I have a hydroxide compound, if I have a base that doesn't dissolve very well in water, if I add acid to it by Le Chatelier, I eat up some of the hydroxide and this is going to make my uh, precipitate more soluble. Which of the following substances are going to be more soluble in acidic than in basic solutions? I have NiOH. Does this make OH ions? Yes. If it makes OH ions, 
and the acid chews up those OH ions. Is my NaOH going to be more soluble in acid or less soluble? I'm dissolving Na, NiOH in water. I'm making Ni ions and OH ions. If I add acid to this, does the concentration of my OH increase or decrease? Decrease. Decreases. If it decreases, which way does the equilibrium go? Left or right? Does it go right? It goes right. If it goes right, Benita, am I dissolving more of my NA NIOH? Uh, yes. Absolutely. So if I add acid to this, it forces the reaction to the right. I get more of my NiOH dissolved. What happens if I add base? Jennifer, you there, Jennifer? Yeah, I'm here. If I add OH to my equilibrium, which way does that force my equilibrium? To the left or to the right? To the left. Does this mean I am adding OH to NiOH and making more solid? I would suppose so. So therefore, am I decreasing the solubility? You would increase it? I'm, you're, think of what you just said, Jennifer. You're pushing the equilibrium to the right. So am I making more solid? Yeah. If I'm making more solid, is my Na, NiOH less soluble in the liquid? Yeah. So I is less soluble in base, more soluble in acid. Keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen. I one more one more thing I want to talk about. And that is will a precipitate form. Important concept. I would assume you're going to get at least one of these questions on the test. All right, we have to think about what cues were in equilibriums before. A Q is using the equilibrium expression to come up with a number that is then compared to the equilibrium constant. If the number is equal to the equilibrium constant, the solution in this case is going to be saturated. If it's saturated, some precipitate forms because we have to have some solid in the equilibrium. If the Q is less than KSP, you're gonna get the solid dissolving until K is equal to KSP. If Q is greater than KSP, more of the salt will precipitate out. The key is, if I'm asked, when does precipitation occur? It's when your Q equals KSP. That's when you get a solid. Will a precipitate form when 100 milliliters of 0.008 lead nitrate solution is added to 
400 milliliters of five times 10 to the minus third sodium sulfate. All right, you have to look at the double displacement reaction. And you have to realize what is happening. Sodium nitrate dissolves completely. It's the lead sulfate we're looking at. We know that because the KSP for lead sulfate is so small. So if I have lead nitrate, Nitrates completely dissolve in water. So if I have 8.0 times 10 to the minus third molar lead nitrate, I have 8 times 10 to the minus third molar lead because I have one lead ion that is produced from my lead 2 nitrate. If I have point if I have five times 10 to the minus third molar sulfate, sodium sulfate, I produce one sulfate for every sodium sulfate. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Sodium sulfate completely dissolves. So if I have 5.0 times 10 to the minus third molar sodium sulfate, I have 5.0 times 10 to the minus third sulfate. I also know the volumes of each one of them. So I'm going to multiply my volume times my concentration of my lead ion. If I do that, this gives me 0 0.10 times 8 times 10 to the minus third moles per liter. This gives me 8 times 10 to the minus fourth moles of lead. You have to understand, I've mixed 100 milliliters with 400 milliliters. My total solution now is going to be 500 milliliters or 0.5 liters. So this is my constant, this is the number of moles of lead it's no longer in 0.10 liters, but it is now in 0.50 liters. So to get the new concentration of lead, I'm gonna to have to take the moles of lead, divide it by the new volume. That gives me my new concentration of lead. I look at my sulfate. I have 0.40 liters of sulfate times the concentration of sodium sulfate, that is going to give me 0.4 liters times the concentration. That will give me my moles of sulfate. Again, it's no longer in 40.40 liters, but it is in 0.50 liters. So now I have my concentration of sulfate. My Q, my Q is equal to my lead concentration times my sulfate concentration. I multiply those out and I get a number, 6.4 times 10 to the minus six. My KSP, is 6.3 times 10 to the minus seventh. Q is greater than KSP. I get a precipitate. As long as Q equals KSP, I will have a solid. It's when KSP is greater than Q that I do not have a solid. Questions, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. 
Is it that easy, guys? Talk to me. Is it that easy that you're not asking questions? Or are you so totally lost that you don't know what's happening? The second one. Okay. Can we like do another problem for this one? We're gonna do the problem that is sitting there in front of you. As a matter of fact, Jenna, you're gonna work through the first part of it with me. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I have a solution of sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride completely dissolves in water. I mix it with a solution of calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate completely dissolves in water. I mix the two together. I want to know if I get a solid. Now, if I take sodium fluoride and put that in the water, how many sodium ions do I make for each sodium fluoride, Jenna? Um, just one. One to one. So mm -hmm. if I have 2.0 times 10 to the minus two molar sodium, I, a sodium fluoride, I also have two times 10 to the minus one molar so, uh, fluoride, right? Yes. Because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So Jenna, look at the second compound. What is the concentration of calcium ions? Uh, so one to two. One times 10 to the minus two, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I know how much volume I have of each one. Jenna, can I get the moles? Yes. Yeah, how do I get the moles? Uh, just multiply by the volume. Multiply by the volume. So when I do that, when I do that, I've got multiply the 0 0.050 liters times my fluoride concentration. This means that I have 0 0.0167. All right, let me stop here. I multiply the 0 0.50 liters times my fluoride concentration. This gives me 0 0.001 moles of my fluoride, but I have to realize I've mixed the solutions, my volume has changed. So I have to take my moles and divide it by 0 0.060 liters. This gives me a concentration of fluoride of 0 0.0167. Quick question. Me, Jenna. Jenna? Yes, I'm with you. I was just waiting for a question. Yeah, I have a question. I'm here, Anaya. It's um, it's is it is it sixty liters because that's the that's both of them combined. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because what okay. happened is I had a solution. I have fifty milliliters of two times ten to the minus two molar sodium fluoride that was completely dissolved in the water. Okay. I had ten milliliters of calcium nitrate. It was in a concentration of one times 10 to the minus two molar. I mixed the calcium nitrate into the sodium fluoride. I now have 60 total mill milliliters of solution. Okay. So that's why I'm dividing it by the 60 at this point. Okay. Okay. Now my calcium is... I'm sorry, I'm confused here. I confused myself. This is moles. That has to also be divided by 0 0.060 liters. This is going to equal 
Okay, point, I'm sorry, one E E, one E E negative four divided by point zero six. This is also equal to point zero one six seven molar. So I do this math out, I get 4.64 e to the minus eighth. My KSP is 3.9 times 10 to the minus fourth. Q is larger than KSP, I get a precipitate. Is it making a little more sense, Jenna? I have a question. Yes, Emily. So, Will we have to like print out the appendix before no. the test or will no. you give it to us? No, I will give you the KSPs. Okay, thank you. Emily, are you understanding what's going on? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you go back to the slide we were just on real quick? I'm kind of confused on where the one point times, where it says one point E times to the negative four moles. I'm confused on where you got that from. I'm sorry, where? Uh, it's like Calcium the, moles or fluorine moles? Calcium. Okay. Ah. You're, you're wondering why this is, Okay. Is this making a little more sense, Jordan? Yeah, I understand that, but I, I'm what I don't understand is where the neck. So it says one point e to the negative four. I don't understand how we got that. Is that from a multiple? Multiplying? If you, this is point zero one multiplied by point zero one. Okay. Okay, so you just multiplied them. Yes. Okay. Because, uh, Jordan, I've got the volume. This is the volume of my fluoride multiplied by my concentration. I do my volume times my concentration. I get moles. Then I have to redivide it by the new volume. Okay. Thank you. I really don't think you're getting these. So we're gonna continue doing these until we, until 1220. We have a solution that contains a concentration of silver and a concentration of lead. When chloride is added to the solution, both silver chloride and lead chloride dissolve or precipitate. What concentration of chloride is necessary to, 
to precipitate each one. Which salt precipitates first? This is a question like the question in the quiz. Okay, now, which KSP is smaller? One point eight e times ten e to the minus two. tenth, or one point seven times ten to the minus fifth. Which one is smaller? The AGCL. So I have to think what KSPs are. KSPs are the product of the ions concentration, correct? Correct, guys? Yes. Yep. So, which concentration is going to be lower to reach the KSP? Let me rephrase that. KSP is going to be equal to silver times chloride ions. The other KSP is going to be equal to lead times chloride ions squared. Which KSP is smaller? Again, Parker said the silver chloride. So what am I going to have? Which concentration of chloride has to, can be smaller and still reach the KSP? All right, guys. You're not logically thinking this. So write this down. The smaller the KSP, the more likely you're going to have solid. Smaller the KSP, the more likely you're going to have solid. So if I have both lead and iron in solution and I add chloride ion there, the silver should precipitate out before the lead. So I know what my silver concentration is. It's one times 10 to the minus two molar. I know what my KSP is. I also know that when lead chloride goes into solution, I make lead, I make, what, sorry, when I can make, put silver chloride into solution, I make the KSP equal to my silver concentration times my chloride concentration. Those two multiplied together equal my KSP, which for silver is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. I know what my silver concentration is. So I just take my KSP divided by my silver concentration and I get the concentration that my chloride has to be to precipitate out. Does that make sense to you, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, I think that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. In this case, I also have my lead chloride, but my lead expression is PB times chloride squared because I have PBCl2. KSP is equal to one times 10 to the minus seven, fifth. So I know what my lead concentration is because my lead, my lead is equal to two times 10 to the minus two molar. So my KSP for lead chloride is gonna be lead times the concentration of chloride squared. This is gonna mean that I'm dividing my 1.5 by my concentration of lead, that's equal to my chloride ion squared, 
I take the square root of it. This means that my concentration has to be all the way up to 2.9 times 10 to the minus two. I need this much chloride to precipitate out my lead. I need only this much chloride to precipitate out my silver. Which concentration is lower? 1.8 times 10 to the minus eighth or 2.9 times 10 to the minus two? 1.8 times 10 to the minus eight. So that means, think about this. As I'm adding chloride in, I reach the lower concentration first. So as I'm adding chloride, I've reached my silver limitation where it starts to precipitate out. So that's going to keep on precipitating out my silver until I have no more silver in solution. Then I'm going to keep on adding the chloride until I reach the concentration of 2.9 times 10 to the minus 2. Then my chloride is going to start to precipitate out my lead. Is that making sense? Natalia. Natalia, are you with me? Is it making sense to you? Natalia. Yeah. Benita, is this making sense? Somewhat. You're going to need to work through these problems. Jana, is it making sense to you? Jana? Okay, am I taking another roll? I'm sorry, did you call my name? Yes, I did, Jana. Is it I'm making sorry. sense to you? Yeah, I got it. Emily? Yes. I mix magnesium and copper into a solution. I have magnesium ions. The concentration of those are 0 0.050 molar magnesium. I have 0 0.020 molar copper. Which ion will precipitate first as I add base to this solution and which concentration is necessary to precipitate each cation. KSP is equal to 10 to the minus 11th for magnesium. It's equal to 10 to the minus 20th for copper. Again, the lower the KSP, that means the lower the concentration I'm going to need to precipitate out that salt. So copper hydroxide will precipitate out first, then the magnesium. Let me copy some numbers down and we'll go through this. Okay, I have, we'll deal with the copper first. Since that's the first one, it's going to precipitate. I have 2.2. My KSP for copper is equal to 2.2 e to the minus 20th. 
concentration is equal to 0 0.020 molar. And my expression is Emily, yes. what is my KSP expression? When I talk about KSP expression, I want the concentration of my ions raised to a power if that's necessary. What is my KSP expression, Emily? Um, Cu in times OH to the second power. Okay. Ah. Emily, do I know what my KSP is? Yes. What is it? 2.2 .2 times 10 to the negative 20. That's equal to? Do I know what my CU concentration is? 0 0.020. Do I know what my do I know what my concentration of OH is? No. I'm going to do this in a second. It makes a little more sense to me. So I, div I divide my 2.2, 10 to the 20th by and I get 1.1 e to the negative 18th is equal to 0.2. equal to x squared One point oh four e to the negative ninth is equal to x. So all it's going to take is one point zero four times ten to the minus ninth to dissolve copper to dissolve uh, to precipitate copper hydroxide out of this solution. If I am doing magnesium. Magnesium's concentration is 1.8 e to the minus, I'm sorry, 0 0.05 molar. KSP is equal to 1.8 e to the minus 11th. Magnesium What am I making out of this? What am I making out of this? We're going to go with Jessica. You there Jessica? Yeah. Okay, what am I making out of magnesium hydroxide? Um, Mg plus a few. And then plus? Two OH. Two OH. Minus? Two OH minus. So, Jessica, 
my KSP is equal to what? Concentration of what times the concentration of what? Um. I don't know. I don't know is a good answer. Uh, let's see if um, Vanessa can help you. Vanessa. Yes. Do you know what the KSP expression is? Yes. Um. I don't see it here in my notes. Vanessa, look at the slide. The slide? Look at the. Oh, would, be, would it be 1.8 e? That, yes, it's equal to 1.8 e to the minus 11th, but that's oh, equal to the concentration. What concentration times what concentration? The concentration of MgOH. Is the MgOH going to be a solid? Yes. So do we include that? Do we include solids in any equilibrium expression? Mm, no, it would be the aqueous, right? So tell me what we're going to make for the equilibrium expression. Would it be the um, Mg2 plus? And then the 2OH minus? Not 2OH minus. OH minus? OH minus. And then two? Squared. Okay. Okay. So Anaya. Let's finish this up, Anaya. Okay. All right. Plug in numbers for me. Well, um, well, I would say that, um, well, after this step, I would say that we multiply the magnesium and OHS. Yes? Do I have the OH concentration? No. So would it be okay? Um point zero five zero um times the KSP. Plug numbers in and I am what's the KSP? Oh, okay. So wait, would it it would be um the K the one point eight to the uh negative eleven. So I'm gonna equals, plug that in for KSP here. Yeah, and then equals um point zero five zero, and then you would have or your OH would be your X. And then what you would do, you would um uh you would divide your 0 0.050 by your KSP and then that would give you x squared and then you would do the square root of um 3.6 e to the negative 10. So what this is saying is I would have to add enough OH and that would be 1.9 times 10 to the minus fifth OH to pre precipitate out my magnesium whereas it only took 1.04 times 10 to the minus fourth to, to precipitate out my my copper. Now, this means
If I take the negative log of this, this means I need a pH of 8.98 to precipitate out the copper. to precipitate out the, to precipitate out the magnesium, I'm gonna need a pH of 4.72. Questions, ladies and gentlemen. I want to do, I want to do some more ice things with you because that I th haven't done enough of ice with uh, Doing this on the fly, guys. Remember, I need to reach my KSP in order to precipitate out a solution. So my KSP for copper hydroxide is 6.3 e to the minus 31. Very, very small number. My pH is equal to is equal to two. This means my POH is equal to 14 minus two, or it's equal to 12. If that's the case, then my OH concentration Remember, POH is equal to negative log of the OH concentration. So I take 10 raised to the negative 12th power is going to be equal to my OH concentration, my OH 
concentration is equal to one times 10 to the minus 12th. Just checking something here, guys. Okay. My copper is breaking into Okay, how do we solve the problem? I've only got two things to worry about, my copper ions, and my OH ions. What's my initial copper? I don't know what it is. Damn it. My initial hydroxide is one e to the minus 12. Correct, guys? Now, am I producing much OH from copper hydroxide? I'm getting crickets. Anybody still out there? No. I'm not producing much, so I can literally take this 2x that forms and throw it away. I know what my equilibrium, my KSP is. My KSP is going to be equal to x times 1 e to the negative 12th quantity squared. My KSP is going to be 6.3 e to the minus 31st. So I take my 6.3 e to the minus 31st divided by 
1 e to the negative 12th divided again by 1 e e negative 12th and I get my copper concentration has to be equal to 6.3 e to the minus 7th. Okay, I'm beyond the point. Test on Tuesday. I've talked a lot about titration curves. I've definitely gone through ice diagrams. I've talked about this, solubility products. I would definitely be studying those. Jennifer, I promise to look and give you an answer key for the, um, for the uh, thinking questions. Thank you, thinking questions. I promise to look and find that. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? I will also edit the test better this time. Be oh, reminded I guys, keep my phone number handy. If you run into any problems with the test, Give me a call. I'm going to put a note in there specifically telling the honor lock that you are able to call me. Specifically, just make the announcement. I am calling my professor now. Everything should be cool, okay? Professor, Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? I do. I'm here. Uh, so my question is about the KSP. Why is KSP equal to X one E to the power of negative 12 to the power of E uh, to the power of two? Now, X, is, uh, X is the copper concentration. Yeah, but isn't it supposed to be one E to the power of negative 12 plus two X? Yes, it is. But remember, the, look at this, look at this KSP, Jana. Is that number really, 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 really small? Yes, it is. It's really, 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 really small. So literally speaking, I'm not producing much OH from the copper hydroxide. So we would just exclude the 2X? Yes. Okay, thank you. When's the test? Tuesday. You said for the um, the KSP values, you said that if we needed them, you would put them in the problem, right? Like we don't need to have a yes. sheet. Yes. Okay. You do not have to do that on your sheet. If there's a KSP involved or a K equilibrium or a KA, those will be provided. All right. Thank you. If that's it, guys, have a good weekend.